I have written on these chapters before, both in my first book, which I leave unnamed, preferring that people not look up what I now consider a youthful production, from whose positions I have mostly departed, and in my second, Irony in the Old Testament. Thinking about the Hebrew Bible throughout my academic career and since my retirement, I've come to think of it centrally with that title, and not how I was first trained to know it, as the Old Testament. I'm very conscious of its Hebrewness and its antiquity, its setting in a culture so different from ours that we would be quite helpless if transported into it. As the Old Testament, it is the first volume of a two-volume Christian book, and a great many people suppose they're very comfortable with reading Christian books. The New Testament, however, is also the product of an ancient culture, or a combination of them, Jewish, Greek, and Roman, of the first centuries of the Common Era. As products of their times, both volumes think in unfamiliar ways. Many are quick to gloss over this strangeness, partly because there's a long theological tradition of a doctrine of divine inspiration, which says that God made the book so it would bring us truth. Well, perhaps. But in the 21st century, it is no longer comfortably familiar, for example, to use the metaphor of a shepherd for the deity. I know there are still shepherds to be found in our country. In a long life, I've never actually met one, and I doubt that many of my readers have. We have some sentimental paintings that we suppose represent what shepherds do, but their sentimentality is misleading. Moreover, the constant use of the term Lord for both the deity and Christ has come to us from cultures immersed in structures of kingship and aristocracy, where what lords were, or even lowercase l lords, was well known. We are not bound in such structures anymore and the metaphor of a lord or king is an anachronism. The kings or queens in our own day are without political power. I will not suppress evidence from the ancient world of the use of such metaphors for the divine, but I prefer to translate the Lord is my shepherd as Yahweh is my shepherd, and that may propose some healthy unfamiliarity. In any case, I do not suppose that readers are Christian, and I hope that many are Jewish, and any other current persuasion or non-persuasion. It seems to me that recent decades have newly seen the Bible, whether Hebrew or Christian, as an artifact in the public and secular possession, rather than as the exclusive property of the pious. My issue, in any case, is not the search for contemporary relevance, as a long-time student of antiquity, I am mostly impressed by the fact that the Hebrew Bible, and therefore the book of Genesis, was not written for us. I suspect the thought that their work might ever be translated into any other language never came to the storytellers' minds. Though I have tried to translate the Hebrew text in a way that will be intelligible to contemporary readers, it is nevertheless important to me to help you realize that even in an English translation, you are reading an ancient Hebrew book. Nor is this in any common sense a Jewish book. Only in the last centuries before the Common Era was there a religious culture that could sensibly be called Jewish. Before much of the earlier Israelite population was effectually removed from its homeland in the 8th century BCE, by the Assyrians, think the ten lost tribes. The nation was Israel. And following the Babylonian invasion of the remaining territory of the tribe of Judah in the 6th century BCE, it was mostly a province of one foreign empire after another. In any case, Jew means a member of the tribe of Judah. So my effort here is to assist your entry into an ancient culture to see how it did what it did with some of its tales and its lore. Some readers may wonder why I've stopped at the end of chapter 11 of Genesis. It is not as arbitrary as it might seem. 